And as soon as the technology works to, to advance the slides, I'll begin. This is, this is an introduction to our Japa retreat because kirtan, just like this very nice kirtan that was just performed by the devotees here. And japa, there are one's musical and responsive, and the other is something that we do without a group of devotees with kirtan, but just ourselves chanting the holy name. Both are resting upon sound. Of course, the whole of the Vedic process is resting on sound. And the plan is to cover both material sound and spiritual sound. And we'll start with material sound. There's a nice principle. Okay. A leadership principle that says, give credit where credit is due. Have you heard that one before? A good leader gives credit where credit is due as a leadership principle. Remember it, it's a good one. So this came from Banu Swami. Many of you know, most of you know, but in case you don't know, he um, wasn't born in India. He was, as far as I know, born in Japan, but he has become a Sanskrit scholar and he's translated 95 books from Sanskrit to English and is a very valuable resource, library resource for ISKCON devotees or anybody that likes Vaishnava literature in readable English. And because he's done it and done it again and again and again, it's gotten refined over the years. And so it's this wonderful service. And something else that he does from time to time is give lectures to public audiences, to educated audiences. So I saw this uh, presentation, of a YouTube presentation of what I'm showing you from the Chopati Temple, and he described that he presents this to college audiences and educated audiences, but he thought it would be useful for the Chopati devotees to see. So. I asked him, could you send me, and he's very liberal, he sent me. I've, so the, 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 the skeleton is his, and then maybe 80% is things that I've added. But give credit where credit due is. A lot of what's here, some portion of what's here is his. Okay, so what is sound? Sound, uh, what is it about sound that affects our being more deeply than other sounds? What happened? Okay. And there's something special about the Hare Krishna mantra. What's that something that's special about the Hare Krishna mantra? So those are topics that we'll be touching on. And we'll start with something that Prabhupada said about sound. Hopefully. There we go. The beginning of this material world is from sound vibration. I think the scientists also agree, the materialistic scientists, that from sound everything emanates. And it's true they say that, and it's also true that the Vedas say that. Sound is the beginning. This is Srila Prabhupada giving a lecture in Nuvrindavan, Canto 1, Chapter 2, Text 1, where Prabhupada is, this is a transcription of his speaking. Sound is the symptom of the sky. This is Sankhya. Canto 3, Chapter 26 is Sankhya. What he's speaking from Canto 1 is Sankhya. Sound is the symptom of the sky. By sound, we can understand that there is sky, ether. Then, by sound vibration, there is circulation of air. You have got practical experience 
when there's very loud sound vibration, sometimes there's very strong wind also. So, by sound vibration, the wind is started. And by strong wind, electricity is produced. From electricity, water is produced, perspiration. And from water, earth is produced. So, sound is the original element of creation. In Sanskrit language, it is called Shabda Brahma. Brahman, or the absolute truth is, first appears. Absolute truth becomes knowable by sound. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is said, the Lord says, Rasoham Apsokaunteya Prabhasmi Sashi Shuryayo Shabdake. Shabda means sound. If we want to see God, let us hear, first of all, the sound vibration, because that is the beginning. I mean, the Bible te teaches, the Vedas teach, modern science also says, we'll see shortly. Now, th there were some printed documents, and if you didn't get a printed document, it's okay. They'll be circulated for all people who registered as digital copies. And there's a digital copy of the one that you see in the lower left corner, Om and creation. So prior to creation, Om. Cosmic manifestation, Om. After cosmic annihilation, Om. It's primordial. And from that sound vibration, everything comes. That's what this little document says. And it's with scriptural reference. So there, there's the first part. Now this is directly Badu Swami's text. Modern science's conception of material sound and empirical data. There we go. There's been lots of study from the, the scientific point of view about sound. One of the things about sound is sound is very powerful. Whoops. What happened? Sound is very powerful. Each part of our bodies has its own natural frequency. Vibrational medicine is based on the idea that disease is a result of those natural frequencies getting out of tune, whether due to stress, illness, or environmental factors. So there's a wellness modality through sound. And for example, each of these parts of the body on the left, you know, the abdomen, shoulders, lungs, hands and arms, etc., etc., they have a certain natural frequency range. And um, if they're too high or too low, then there's some illness or some, some discomfort, some pain in that part of the body. And there are people that have understood how this works. This is a device that an ISKCON devotee that knows this science has produced. I use one every day. It's called the Healy. And you connect the Healy to your phone. There's an app that you can download if you have one of these things. And let's say, I'll just share. I only take one allopathic medicine, and that's a, a thyroid medication. Because thyroid gland is somewhere here in the body, the, the base of the neck. And it regulates all the other organs of the body. And if it's too high, it's hyperthyroid. If it's too low, it's hypothyroid. And then based upon that thyroid condition, you may take some medication. I've been taking some thyroid medication for 20 years or something like the 15 years, whatever it is, called Synthroid. It's synthetic. I know somebody that had their thyroid gland taken out, and so they just take Synthroid, a certain dosage, and they can function as if, 
So that's the allopathic way, and then there's a vibrational way. So uh, with this Healy, there's, there's a menu, and I re regularly run the, the menu that has thyroid, thyroid harmony it's called. So in short, it's, it's electromagnetic vibration that helps to regulate the proper frequency for each organ of the body, the heart, the head, the lungs, etc., or in emotional states. Like there's an app that I run regularly is memory because my memory is fading. Something happens when you get older. Don't worry about it. You'll, it'll happen to you. <laughs> so your memory isn't working as well, as well as it used to, so I run the, the memory app. It's just a, it, it's a vibration. So what, what does that mean? It's just a vibration. Everything in the universe has a vibration. Our physical bodies, every flower, plant, tree, and mineral. So animate and inanimate, like different minerals have different vibration frequency. You know, the basis of it is an atom. There's little particles moving around. And when particles moving around, it makes a vibration. And that vibration has a certain frequency on the atomic level, the molecular level, and the different molecules get together and make something. And that something has a vibrational frequency. And that vibrational frequency makes a sound. There, that may be inaudible to our human ear, and that's coming next. There's a, a range that the human ear can hear. It says in the last sentence here, from 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. That's the human range. Here's what it, whoops, what happened? The, the usual sense that we have, there we go. The usual sense we have of sound, it's something, it's the movement of air. The air is moving because of the sound. And that movement of the air that hits your eardrum moves the eardrum, the eardrum move some nerve endings, the nerve endings send a signal to the brain and it says, I hear a sound. But so our human ear has a certain range. Now that down in the lower left is small letters. There's the gentleman, Dr. Um, Hertz, who studied originally, eight, you know, long, long ago, electromagnetic, met, electromagnetic waves and could reproduce the system again and again. And through that system, he, he found the audible range of humans, the audible range of the cats and dogs, as you see in the screen. So on the lower end, elephants and moles hear some sounds that we can't hear. And say hear some of the sounds that we can. Cats and dogs hear most of what we hear, but they also hear a frequency range that's much higher. And then way over the far end is bats and dolphins. They can hear things that are really high frequency that we can't hear. So the, the, the usual conception is air movement caused by a vibration, and that vibration and the air movement hits the eardrum, et cetera, and then you can hear something, and it registers in the, the, mind, in the brain, and the, then it reads what that signal is. If you're auditory functions are working properly. Unwanted sound is called noise. Lots of sounds we can't hear because they're different frequencies. So this is a little difficult to coordinate. According to modern astronomy, what Prabhupada said the scientists believe, the scientists believe. And they have a way of you know, I can say speculating, you know, the beginning of creation. They weren't around, so they're speculating. But the beginning of creation, there was a sound, and the sound and their way of looking at things, sound or sound moves matter. I mean, living behind the sound, there's a living entity. But be, the sound moves matter. 
and the sound sculpted the universe. That's how they say. Now, let's hear some sounds that normally are not within the human range. You see a plant that's over on the right side, and they didn't want the plant for a long time. And this is in Tel Aviv, it's a university. They put these very sensitive microphones by the plant, and let's see if our sound system picks up on the sound, but it makes a sound. I thought so, it's not gonna work. Here is, should work on my. Now they, that, the plant made that sound when they dried it out. They just didn't water the plant for some time. Or they cut the plant and with this little microphone system, it's a sound vibration, not only the volume, but the frequency is below human audible range. But they could pick it up and I don't know how they do it, but they made it so that we could hear it. And they've done other things that are on the upper end rather than the lower end. Let's see if we can get to that. This next slide, that was 2005. Oh, wow, this is really cool. Okay, 2014, in Sweden, Chalmers University, they claim, I don't have a recording, they claim that they were able to capture the sound of an atom. In principle, it's just fine because what's an atom? It's little things, neutron, proton, electrons, and neutrinos, and things zooming around, and that makes a sound. So they claim that they have been able to make recordings on that platform. And here's one, and I will play it with my machine. This is, the, this is NASA um, making recordings of Govinda. What they claim is waves of plasma slamming into the Earth's magnetic field lines. Now, I don't know exactly what waves of plasma is, but here's what that sound vibration is. plasma slamming into the magnetic field sounds like. <laughs> but the, the idea is there are sounds that are not within the audible range for a human being, but they're real sounds. Okay. And that's what the text is supposed to say here. The bottom. Human sense of hearing has a certain uh, capacity or range. We can't hear everything. But, you know, it's, it's just supporting the principle. Everything has a sound vibration. The whole universe has a sound vibration. Atoms have a sound vibration. Minerals have a sound vibration. Rocks have a sound vibration. Plants have a sound vibration. Everything is vibrational. Everything is moving on a, on a material level. Everything is moving. Wow, this is including the slide changer is moving. Krishna, Krishna. Now, 
science has taken that principle of sound and morphed it into healing, because I already mentioned one, that little healing. The healing principle, but uh, in this next slide, you see over in the left, you can't see it, Deepak Chopra. He's a big fan or a proponent of sound therapy. There's a bunch of text on the right taken from clinical publications. And it's not just parts of the body that are not functioning properly. It's emotions like loneliness, despair, other harmful emotions that cause then in turn physical disorders. So sound therapy is a, is a modern and popular thing. And just to amplify that, here's a system, Sol Fecchio, I guess that's an Italian name, and there's a principle by Professor Sol Fecchio that says the different chakras, there's seven in number, and each of them has a certain normal range of frequency and by certain knowledge of the solfeggio frequencies, the chakras can heal and then the body can heal. Now that's just a general principle and that general principle then was taken by a yogi who lives in Mysore. Anybody who's from the Mysore area in your upbringing? Nobody? Okay, me either. But I know somebody that went to this place, there's a yogi that somebody that went said he's a multi-billionaire because it works. He understands the principle of sound and how sound can help create wellness in certain chakra energy centers in the body. And it's very effective. So if you happen to have a, or know somebody that has a disease that other modalities of healing aren't working, there's a possibility. My sword. There's other others are well, but this is just about sound and how that works. Uh, here's another celebrity, Pete Seeger. He's a proponent of healing and it's, it draws upon Pythagoras and Aristotle and different teachers have also taught the same principle and it has a capacity. They've demonstrated it many, many, many times clinically that Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, epilepsy, asthma, autism, etc., can be, if not improved, it can, if not cured, at least improved, just by, by sound. Okay. Now we'll go to the brain, or these studies on the brain. And you see on the left side, there's normal ranges of brain frequencies for deep sleep, light sleep, and, um, whoops, what happened? Gosh, this is just not cooperating. The alpha is the third one down, and alpha waves are awake and relaxed. It's a meditative state. You see the range between eight and 13. And it turns out this alpha wave range, commonly they say it's, a, it's about 8.7, 8.9. It's the frequency of the earth. It's called Schumann resonance. You know, Dr. Schumann found out the earth has a vibrational frequency. And that vibrational frequency of the earth happens to be the same vibrational frequency of a human brain in a meditative state. Therefore, yogis that like meditation, they wouldn't go into cities or other places. They would go to the forest, engage in meditation because it was conducive, the same vibrational frequency. And down at the bottom, that's um, where one is the fight or flight brain wave. You know, when it's very excited and not only awake, but extra awake and very alert. 
and that can be um, debilitating if it's done too much. Oh gosh. Okay. So you can't hear it, but you can see it. There's a fellow that's going to be doing three things. There's a table. There's some powder that he's going to spread at random on the table. And then he's going to make vibrational sounds. And you'll see the powder jumping up and down and forming geometric patterns that are star-shaped or like a mandala. Let's see if it works. sound has form. change instruments, take a different tool, make a different vibrational frequency, and it's going to change. The powder's going to jump around according to the vibrational frequency and make a different pattern. The word cymatics come from a Greek word that has to do with sound having form. Using the same principle, there's, there, they, have, they have taken pictures of the form of each of the notes of the musical scale. Here's the notes of the musical scale, and there's a particular frequency, and the particular frequency works. I'll, I'll share something. Once upon a time, I was a little boy. And I was the youngest of five children. I had three older sisters and an older brother. He was the oldest. And two of my sisters, they liked piano, so our parents bought them the piano. And they would play the piano, you know, some amount of time every day. And periodically, the piano tuner would come. So I didn't play the piano, but I was a curious little boy. So when he came in the door, I wanted to check him out and see what he was going to do. So when he came in the door, it looked like he was carrying a guitar case. But it wasn't a guitar case. It was something else. So you opened up the case, and there were two main things. Tuning forks, maybe from you know, music class in school, you learned what a tuning fork is. It's a rod that has a U shape, kind of like T-lock. And a C, let's say the C tuning fork, it has a, there's a rubber mallet, that's the third thing. And you strike the C tuning fork, and it vibrates. And he would hold, let's say, the tuning fork, once it's vibrating, near the C piano cable or piano cord. And it wouldn't vibrate the ones to the left or to the right. He didn't touch it to the piano cord. He held it near. And when he held it near, it would vibrate because there was already the frequency of that piano string and vibrating the, the tuning fork, it made it vibrate. And if it was too tight or too loose, it wouldn't vibrate in harmonic manner going down the line. So then he had a little tool that would tighten it or loosen it and do it again and again until it was the right frequency with the piano string. Then he put the C away, go to F sharp and 
etc., etc., do the whole piano, up and down. And then he, you know, went home. That was tuning the piano. The idea is, that's how spiritual, that's how sound works, and that's how Hare Krishna mantra works, or any spiritual sound works. That is to say, there's already something inside, and you vibrate that something in a certain vibration, a spiritual vibration, brings this, the resonance that's already within out. That's how spiritual sound works. Here's a chart. Whoops. You didn't see that chart. There's the, all the notes of the musical scale. Different frequency. I'm seeing on my computer, and anyway. Here's a photograph of each musical note or a number of musical notes and the geometric pattern they make or the form that that sound has, that vibrational sound has a form. Everything has, everything has a vibration and vibration sound, material sound has form. There's classical music. There was some nice kirtan when we came in. But there's further and further and further refinements of classical music. Cl classical music is it's raga, and it's just a string of notes, and this string of notes and that string of notes create a certain raga. Just like in our devotional practices, we have a morning raga, we sing the Guruvastakam prayers. And we all know the melody. It's morning raga. I mean, people that know the science, that's what they know it as. Samsara dava nalalida loka, etc. And then if that same song is sung midday, it's a midday raga. And the same song is sung in the evening, it's an evening raga, because it's to be sympathetic or in harmony with the mood of that particular day. It's raga sound, in particular configurations of notes or vibrations, makes for a certain mood. It affects your emotional level. It affects your devotional level, if it's done nicely. And <clears throat> they found that the classical music has the effect of reducing cortisol levels so that, for example, when somebody has to have a medical procedure, they don't require sedative or it requires very little sedative because they're very calm just by that sound. And the opposite true is rock music. Rock music has an effect of increasing cortisol levels and gets one's wired up and hyped up and it becomes addictive. It's like a coffee addiction or caffeine addiction. And so in, in this way, people that really like this kind of music, they can't get enough of it and they go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one. It's different than um, raga bhakti. It's something else. It's cortisol bhakti. And we know from the modes of nature Oh, machine, please work. There we go. There's three modes of nature, and sounds have different effect. Sattva Rajas Thomas sounds, not, not a simple point at the bottom, not all sounds have the same effect. Here's some examples of how sound can have effect on plants. The illustration on the right is showing m musical notes. And studies have been done to see what's the effect of music on plants. Now, something different between plants and us is plants don't have ears, they don't have a nervous system, and they don't have a spinal co column. But nonetheless, sound affects plants. And this, you know, decades have been, of studies have been done. Here's a little excerpt from one study, rock music, they wilt. Sometimes they die. And when there's, they call it Gandharva music, or a very pleasing music, they flourish. Sometimes they've found 
that the plant will embrace the speaker. And sometimes, if it's hard, heavy music, the plant will lean away from the speaker over time, not instantly. So sound effects, even plants. So you can guess who is the next entity that gets tested. It's the rats because they have ears, and they have a spinal column, and they have a nervous system. So what's the effect on rats or mice? Tokyo University, they did a very nasty thing. They did heart surgery on a group of male mice to see what would happen. And they exposed them, that they injected some foreign material inside their body and sewed it back up again, and then played hard music and soft music. And even there were specific Irish singers, something, something. And they wanted to see how they would respond. You know, some that heard the nice music that they survived, and more than survived, some of them ejected or eliminated the foreign tissue that was put in their body, and the other ones didn't make it. Then they wanted to see further. Does sound affect their IQ? How are you going to test the IQ of a, of a rat? Well, they put them in front of a, a maze, and at the other end of the maze was some cheese. And then they played music and wanted to see what would happen. So when they played Mozart music or Strauss music, and you know they could make their way to the other end of the maze, they, they, their IQ was better. And when they played voodoo music, well, it didn't work so well. They started becoming cannibalistic. They couldn't get, the, couldn't get the cheese, and they turned on each other and went mad. So that happens to people, too, sometimes. Exposed to the wrong kind of sound vibration, they become mad. Don't be surprised if you meet some mad people. Here's this picture of Schumann residence. I mentioned it. It's the vibrational range of the Earth planet. And it's somewhere in the vicinity of 7.83, which is the same as the meditative state of the of brain waves when one is really absorbed in sound, in sound meditation. The illustration is showing there's electricity. Every hour, there's a certain number of average electric charges through lightning that strike the Earth planet the earth planet becomes charged, electromagnetically charged, and there's a certain resonance of the earth planet. And now, we're ready for the next section. How does spiritual sound, what does science have to say about, what does spiritual sound have to do with the body and mind? So we know the word mantra, we're well informed. College kids may not know, so we just explain. Man means mind, and tra means to free. Frees the mind from the suffering condition. And a basic mantra that everyone knows, even non devotees know commonly, is, is Om. So here's a little recording of some nice, soft music. And in some traditions, it's part of their tradition. Instead of saying a mantra with the, the Hare Krishna words or other words, it's just Om, with the understanding that the primordial sound before there was stuff, before there was creation and varieties of matter, was the sound of Om. And by vibrating the sound of Om, it connects you with that eternal, primordial existence, the spiritual realm. Know it or not. And so there are persons that that's, that, that's their tradition that they follow. And this goes on for three hours if you want to find it on YouTube. Om chanting. Something happened. Yeah. So, 
on the right side, there's another document you're supposed to have received or you will receive if you register. And it's a document that says two things, two documents actually. Vishnu Sahasranam, 1,000 names of Vishnu, uh, is Vishnu, one of the names of Vishnu is Omkar, because Omkar indicates the presence of Vishnu, and there's a non-difference between the two, Omkar and Vishnu. There's a little document that says more than just what I just said. And there's another very interesting Jiva Goswami document extracted from his writings that the sound of Om or Omkara is within all Jivas. It's like the tuning fork example. If you chant Om, what happens? It's like hitting the C tuning fork and holding it near the, the C piano ca uh, cord or, or cable or string it'll vibrate. So that sound vibration vibrates what's already within us. Spiritual consciousness becomes awakened by spiritual sound. And it's already there. It just material sound works one way, spiritual sound works another way. And this other diagram, you'll see this again. This is the cover picture of Brahma Samhita because in Brahma Samhita, the realizations of Brahma are coming from sound. The sound that Brahma heard, the, the painting, illustrates he's on his lotus flower, darkness in all directions, but he hears a sound. And the sound is, one of the sounds he hears is the sound of Krishna's flute. The sound goes in his ear, according to Brahma Samhita, and it comes out his mouth in the form of Gayatri Mantra. One of the Gayatri Mantras that because we're in the line of Brahma, Madhva, Gaudiya, Sampradaya, we receive that same mantra that he received from Krishna's flute. And it's a, it's a process of meditation, and it's sound meditation. Now there's details. Sound meditation can be silent or not audible for others to hear, but it's nonetheless a sound meditation. And now next, Next. There we go. There's the gentleman, Dr. Hans Jenny, that started this cymatics experiment. You know, this is in the 1960s. So he created this machine that did three things. On the one side, on the far right, you can see how old it is. It's something that generates sound. Second, a tube or a channel through which that generated sound is carried. And the third is at different surfaces with powder on the surfaces, and he would direct the sound generated from the, the sound generating device to that surface uh, where it had powder on it or other things, and salt, sand, different, different materials. And he wanted to see what would happen. That's, he started this cymatics thing, and what you see on the right, that is a photograph of when he projected the sound of Om onto that vibrating surface. And the diagram on the left is a Sri Yantra. What's a Sri Sri Yantra? A Sri Yantra is part of a part of Vedic worship, and it's a depiction, a two-dimensional depiction of Vaikuntha. So the sound ohm projected by Dr. Hans Jenny's machine created this. This is a photograph that was in color um, showing a Sri Yantra. Now, here's a Yantra of one of the 18 syllable mantras that we chant when we chant besides chanting ohm. It's another 18 syllable mantra and it's mentioned in Brahma Samhita text number three you can read and it's in the purport but here's a diagram of the yantra as he was chanting his mantra 
He was also meditating upon the yantra. Now, it's not a process that we use, but some of you have no, may have noticed in uh, the Mayapur temple. How many here have been to the Mayapur temple? Many. Okay. Look closely, or look at a photograph if you don't go there. At the base, on the left and on the right, there's a square brass plate, and on the square brass plate is an Ashringa Yantra. It's a two-dimensional depiction of Nishringa Dev's abode. And it's part of the process of worship of the Nishringa Dev deity. So this is part of the worship of Lord Brahma, found in Brahma Samhita, text number three. And those of you that know Sanskrit, you can recognize in the middle is Klim, and then the other parts of that internal triangle, is, it's a hexa, hexagon, those are the names of the mantra. In case you read Sanskrit, you can know the mantra. It's one of this, the 18th syllable mantra. And it's described in Sri Brahma Samhita very nicely. Similarly, just as scientists say that sound shaped the universe, so the Vedas say sound shapes the universe. Sound moves matter. Of course, behind sound is a person, so a person moves matter, but sound moves matter. And there's this description that just as sound, whoops, Krishna, Krishna. Just as sound moves with symmetry, so there's a two-dimensional depiction of the shape of the universe. And if you look closely at the depiction of this very ancient two-dimensional picture of the universe, it looks very much like Bhumandala, with the seven rings and seven islands, and in the center is Sumeru, etc., etc. font is different on my screen than this screen. Okay. Again with Raga, there, there is, I'll, I'll just do this much. With Raga, um, in South India, there's a very famous Karnataka singer. Maybe some of you know the person's name. Bala Murari Krishna. You know him? You know of him. When um, he was, there's a little story. I heard this from Revati Raman. As you may know, the Tirupati temple was built in, almost entirely from book sales because the TTD gave permission to the devotees to have book stalls. And as they were having their book stalls, one of the things they did was they played music of Prabhupada singing, bhajans, you know, softly in the background. And one devotee at one of these book stalls noticed this fellow was standing there as if in trance, and he thought, the man's a thief. He's trying, waiting for an opportunity to steal something. So he went forward and spoke to him rather rudely. And then another devotee came and, you know, pulled him to the side and said, that's a celebrated man. He's this Bala Morali, Krishna. He's a celebrated man. So they spoke to him instead of, you know, accosting him. And he said, I, I, I've never heard a voice like this. It was Prabhupada's voice. He's from another realm, just hearing Prabhupada singing. Very much. We gave him a couple of books. <laughs> um, with Raga, those who are very, very accomplished in Raga know that with each Raga there's a mantra. And the mantra depicts the personality of the Raga. So the one that's shown on the left is a Pingala Raga, and it's the Pingala Raga where the Per, the presiding personality of the raga is Radha and Krishna on a swing. So the person who is the very, 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 that's three berries, expert at raga, they meditate on the mantra before they begin the raga, 
and through the raga, the personality presiding over that raga is conveyed, and the audience, that's really skilled audience, can envision the personality of the raga. That's very elevated and very subtle, but the idea is just part of this whole theme. Sound has form. And there's different degrees of subtlety of how that is that sound has form. I'm going to try to move on because of time. And um, this is showing strands of DNA. So people that studied DNA, this is how sound affects matter, spiritual sound affects matter. So people that study DNA found that there are these little things attached to the DNA. It's called telomeres. And when they found out that there were the telomeres attached to DNA, they wanted to find out what do they do. And they found that telomeres have two main benefits. They create longevity, and they help create immunity from disease. That is, people that have strong telomeres are not so inclined to, take, to get, become ill, and people that have strong telomeres, they live longer. So the lady that found this out about telomeres, she wanted to find out what makes them stronger. She found that vigorous exercise, like brisk walking for 10, 12 minutes a day, makes stronger telomeres by 5%. So that became a popular thing. It's still a popular thing. It's, it's a healthy thing, but it became healthy, promoted by the telomere effect. And then they, they wanted to find out what were some of the other things. So they found that when there's community coming together and sharing and joy, that sometimes it's not always joy in the material world. But when it's joyful, it, it strengthens telomeres 3 to 5 percent. Diet has an effect on telomeres 3 to 5 percent. But much to their surprise, Sanskrit mantras increased telomeres by 43 percent. So dear devotees, if you want strong telomeres, do lots of chanting. And it's not just Hare Krishna mantra, but it's, it's also on Sanskrit. And they found it's less, but also effective, just prayer. In general speaking, just prayer. It has a, a very powerful effect. I'm trying to finish because time keeps moving. Here's a study that was done by a devotee at the University of Florida in Gainesville, making it short. He got a PhD in the effects of chanting Hare Krishna mantra compared to other mantras. There's a long version and a medium version. I'll tell the short version. He put an ad in the Gator. He, first of all, to get a PhD, you can't just wing it. You've got a whole bunch of PhD fellows that overlook even what your plan is. And they tweak it and refine it, and you know they finally approve the plan. So the plan was, he put an ad in the Gator Press that said, you get $35 if you're chosen to do the following experiment. And the following experiment is, here's a sacred mantra, ancient mantra, and it's beneficial in these three ways. It decreases depression, it will uh, help you become free from anxiety, and if there's some tendency for drug abuse, it will relieve you of that difficulty to some degree and increase the quality of goodness. So people answered. They were interviewed just on the basis it could be any kind of background, just two things. They do it, and they report honestly. So and then some, they were, and then everyone, there were three groups. Group one, Hare Krishna mantra. Group two, another Vedic mantra, a genuine Vedic mantra. Group three, a placebo group, a gobbledygook syllables, and they all said the same thing. This is an ancient mantra that does the following three things. And so do this for 15 minutes a day for the next three months, and bingo, you, you help me get my PhD. And you will, your, 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 uh, rep how your report will be published in my PhD report. So fast forward three months later, the chanting of the Hare Krishna group registered the highest response in all three areas. 
And then he ended his PhD thesis saying, and there's further research that could be done like this and like this and like this. So it's effective, at least in Gainesville University. Now, it's five minutes after eight. What time am I supposed to end? Who's the timekeeper? 8.20. 8.30. Okay, I want to, you know, keep the schedule. So quickly, Vedic conception of sound. This is, Vedic conception of sound comes from Canto 3, Chapter 26, Sankhya Philosophy, Kapila Dev. It's a very crunchy chapter. It's, you have to chew it a whole bunch before you can digest it. Uh, but it, it's in, in that section, it says, sound has three purposes. It conveys the idea of an object. It indicates the presence of a speaker who is remote. You can't see them, but you tell there's a speaker there or a thing that's making the sound. And it's a subtle form of ether. So we use sound vibration in language and culture all the time. And, you know, it depends on the, you know, the grammar and how you configure your grammar. That's not my illustration, by the way. That's Banu Swami's. Okay. Just like modern science and just like this other description, Vedic ontology says that sound is the fundamental principle and source of matter. Before there's matter, and matter is there and unmanifest, but it makes it manifest. There's other factors, but it starts with sound. And um, there's sound in ether. And Krishna says, I'm the sound in ether and the ability in man. Sound is both, it's a it's vibration, both subtle or mental, and then also physical. And the common way that physical sound works is, let's just do this one. Where is it? Yeah, this is the one I want to, this is it. Okay. It's a nice, this is Canto 11, Chapter 21, Text 36. So material sound is on the left, and spiritual sound is on the right. And material sound doesn't reach transcendental consciousness. But it goes through this ear, so it is, you know, the sound, here comes the sound, the eardrum vibrates, and a signal is picked up by the nervous system, it's vibrating. The signal is sent to the mind, the brain, but this, the mind, then, oh, I hear a sound. Just like there's a sound of a, I guess, the heater. And there's a blower, there's a fan over here somewhere. It's, you know, it's, it's low, but it's audible. So now I, th it, it goes into the ear, it goes to the mind, and then the intelligence starts to analyze, what's that sound? That's the discriminating factor or faculty of human existence. And generally, material sound stops there. It doesn't go, so the Sanskrit terms are, are indicated in the center, but it's ear, mind, and intelligence. And then there's the para. And spiritual sound goes all the way to the para stage. That is, it goes through the same channels. It may seem to be material sound, but it's not because it goes to the soul platform. And it's like the tuning fork it vibrates that piano string, not the other ones next to it, just that one. And so the soul becomes vibrationally activated by spiritual sound, and spiritual consciousness becomes activated. There's obstacles, and that's, you know, material conceptions, but that, so that is also an effect of spiritual sound. At least the potency is there to remove the coverings the misidentification type of things, upadi type of things, 
and leave what's left. What's left is who we really are. And that's the effect. This is Vedic ontology of the effect of spiritual sound. All the, what's on the left is, is saying what I just said. So it, it's a very important principle of our process of chanting. Here's our process of chanting. This is a young devotee. It's God's sister, Sikandini. She's photographed chanting Japa. And there she is, vibrationally reaching towards Krishna. There's a via media, and that's the spiritual master, her spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. But the connection is directly with Krishna, and Krishna is hearing the sound and reciprocating with the sound through sound. He's making himself present through sound. So it's a, it's a yoga principle through sound. Now I'm going to end this just because of time. And I hope it works. Let's see if it works. I know a devotee whose father is in the hospital saying goodbye to everybody because his, his health is, is deteriorated to that stage. They're not pulling the plug, but it's just days. So I sent this recording to the devotee and said, put it by your father's ear, let him hear. Because in this recording, there's this soft music but in addition, it's the sound vibration. We heard that the soft sound has a relaxing, soothing, cortisone level reducing, stress level reducing, health restoring facility. Just material sound, the music in the background. But you add to that, the spiritual sound and the sound of a pure devotee is very special. So we're here for a Japa retreat and hopefully we'll be getting closer to the kind of chanting that Srila Prabhupada taught us. Material sound is entangling and we're involved. Here's a purport to Srimad Bhagavatam in the Sankhya section. We're entangled in material affairs because of material sound. And you just change the channel. And it's not like 100% snap your fingers. But by increasing the spiritual sound that we hear qualitatively as well as quantitatively, and uh, we, we, com our material complexities become transformed. Last, this is the last slide. This is showing a full moon. And the full moon is being reflected on a body of water, a lake or something, with a nice mountain in the background. And the teaching that Srila Prabhupada has given us, or the Bhagavatam has given us, is that um, this is just straight from a Bhagavad Gita lecture. Whoops. You're not seeing the same thing I'm seeing. There we go. Bhagavad Gita lecture. I'm sorry. With the images aren't co coordinated. So there's a full moon and a reflection of the full moon in a body of water. And the message that Prabhupada was speaking in this particular Bhagavad Gita lecture was material sounds are but a reflection of spiritual sound. They're derived from spiritual sound. I mean, it, it's throughout the Vedas. There's a very nice section in... Um, Canto 10, chapter 85, I just gave a seminar on this topic, where Krishna's father, Vasudev, is speaking to Krishna like this. You're the original source of all energies. All energies exist in the spiritual realm, and their counterparts are here in the material realm, and there's just a representation of what's there in the spiritual realm. So if you hear a, you hear a sound, someone just coughed, or whatever it is, the sound that you hear a sound. The origin of it 
connected is to the spiritual world. We don't have these sounds without the spiritual world. And there's sound in the spiritual world. And spiritual sound is to connect us with the spiritual world, even within these physical forms. Using the auditory sense primarily and the vibrating sense, the faculty of making a sound and hearing the sound. Or as we were just doing, hearing Srila Prabhupada making the sound and hearing his sound. So either way, Shravanam Kirtanam, Vishnu Smaranam. The sound vibration is the fundamental principle of making our connection with who we really are and the source of where we've come from and furthering that connection through further realization and purification. Foundational basis of Krishna consciousness. So I want to end because the, usually the best part of any class is the discussion part. So can we turn the light on and see if there's some discussion? All right. There you are. Comments or questions? During the Thanksgiving retreat. You know what happened, right? Here's what happened. The, there was a plan to have the Potomac Temple opening on the Thanksgiving weekend, right? And I didn't want to have a competing event. So I went somewhere else. But look, I, here I am. And here you are. And thank you all for coming. I mean, some surprises here. But I'm very happy to be here. Discussion? Yes. I've had a personal... Thank you. Maharaj, I've had a personal experience with the Mahamantra. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> early days of joining Hare Krishna in the early 90s, Maharaj. We had just heard, you know, Mahamantra, chanting occasionally, the Japa. And one day I came back from work, and my father, who's severely diabetic, went into a condition called hypoglycemia, where the sugar level Whoa. goes way down. Whoa. And he lost control of his limbs, his eyes popped out, tongue was, it was very Whoa. scary. Whoa. So a friend of mine was there, he has his jeep, we put him in a blanket, put him on the back of the jeep, Mumbai, uh, office rush. Wow. About two miles away is the hospital, the doctor was treating him for diabetes. It took us almost half an hour, and in panic, and I could see death coming. You know, it was very frightful, that sight. Not knowing what to do, I loudly started, not shouting, but screaming the Mahamantra, from home to the hospital. And, you know, the people around in the cars and the traffic jam, they were wondering what's going on. And we reached the clinic and, you know, everyone running in and out. And they took him and after several hours, the doctor comes and says, it's a miracle. So, you know, medical, whoever's a doctor here will say, there is a fatal level if your sugar level goes down. It's fatal, whatever some number, I don't know, 40 or something. His went way below, so if it's 40, he went to 20, his sugar level. And the doctors had given us a heads up, you know, that it doesn't look good, the initial tests and all that. So I thought, you know, it's this Maha Mantra, but now being around Hare Krishna for a while, chanting should be done in a pure state. I can understand the helpless state, but the intention was to save dad's life. It wasn't really as a service. You get what I mean? Yes. It wasn't as a service asking Krishna, Radharani, engage me in service. So, but I like to think that it's the Mahamantra which saved his life. And of course, he's a musician. After that, he, 24-7, he used to compose Mahamantra huh. Raga, Indian classical huh. Ragas. Huh. So how, does, how do we explain this, Maharaj? On one end, it is you ask for service, but here you put Krishna to your service. 
And how did it work, or was it just emotional? Well, I'm not. I'm. I'm an aspiring transcendentalist. I don't have all answers. But in principle, Krishna gave his mercy through a devotee who was sincere with with some intention, of course, mixed spiritual material, but some intention to reach out to Krishna. Now it's not that so it's Krishna's mercy. The instrument was not a pure instrument. The receiver was not a pure receiver. But Krishna showed his mercy. He doesn't need a reason to show his mercy. He can show his mercy. And he chose to show his mercy. Now it can go the other direction. Or it can go another direction besides those two directions. And ultimately we depended upon Krishna's mercy. And you know, and maybe you know, and maybe for your father's sake, some further service for him and further purification through that experience, or, and or through for you, further purification by your faith in the holy name gets getting bumped up a whole bunch. So Krishna can have multiple purposes. He doesn't doesn't need our approval. <laughs> or a rationale to understand why he does what he does. Because sometimes it goes the other way. I just had a discussion with, with someone recently, and it, you know, th their life got turned upside down, and they don't understand. So, we're, in, we're, de we're dependent. And Krishna is independent, and he can show his mercy however, wherever, whenever he likes. And it's true. I mean, besides Shikshastaka 8, it's true. So what, what, what is it for us to do is this. <laughs> we, we prayasa and we're looking for mercy. And we live our lives that way, serving I am. I'm, I take a reasonable guess. I'm sure, reasonably certain, that your bhakti has not forgotten that incident. Maybe sometimes more acutely remembering, and sometimes less. But your bhakti has taken a big bump. And when whoever you've shared this with, similarly. But it's, it doesn't. We need. A, we don't need a miracle. We just. The miracle is look around and see the lives of people that have been transformed by seriously taking to the chanting of the holy name. Any one of us. And, you know, it, it can be taken from us if we don't protect it and develop it, nurture it properly. That's why we're here. Something up in the front? Yes, he is going to bring the microphone. Quickly, come quickly. Uh, Hare Krishna, uh, Dharmat Pranav. Uh, Maharaj, I just want to make a um, comment on how to improve my chanting by... Like, I'm a physician, so after seeing patients or after being in the rush hour and you come home and you want to do your rounds, so my mind is just all the time going back, flickering here and there. So to settle the mind down for chanting, I do deep breathing first and then begin with Om. Om really settles me down, calms me down, brings into the particular wavelength of the whatever alpha, beta, um, or it just calms me down. And then when I start chanting, again my mind jumps like a monkey. Oh, this patient, I have to do that. Oh, this to-do list and this, this, this. And then again, I've tried a lot of techniques, but one of the best techniques for me is again in between, do deep breathing. Oh. 
again that om again cools me down brings me down to then and then again i start with the hari krishna maha mantra so sometimes i wonder am i doing the right thing or but when you say maha mantra then you are oh rather ani please engage me in your service but when you are doing saying om then it's not please engage me in your service like it's not personal. like yeah but it can it can be it can be functional but it's not personal and it our 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 teaching and reality is the 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 real ballast is a loving relationship not just calm i mean calm is nice but is it the calm is a byproduct canto they just was discussing this canto 5 chapter 5 rishab dave's teachings to his sons and he the first three verses are really good but he defines the characteristics of one who engages in bhakti that arises from good association mahat sevam dwaram ahur vimuktes but it's a characteristic this peacefulness is a subset when bhakti rises so it's not just a peaceful mind because you can make the mind peaceful and then it becomes turbulent again it's not just when you stop chanting om and start chanting hari krishna the mind becomes turbulent again so what to do this is what your what your question <clears throat> I that that's the things to say Sham Sundar is going to say it tomorrow in his class please tune in for his class because he's got a lot of practice at just saying you know answering this kind of question I like uh Patanjali he gives a nice definition of abhyasa abhyasa practice abhyasa practice so it's three things simple every day for a prolonged period of time with faith that's yoga you know paramatma objective yoga but anyone that's done some meditation that's not exactly the hari krishna maha mantra it has a my experience similar to yours it has a soothing beneficial effect it's it has its power and then when you stop that it start things start getting cluttered again patanjali says that the purpose of yoga is chitta vritti the churning of the waves of the sea chitta vritti the waves of the mind moving 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 to bring it to calm position so you say you this is something that helps you and then the, the after that is to see at the bottom of the sea or see who you really are and who you really are isn't just om see, that won't be accessed by chanting om it can be it can be accessed by calming the sea or the swirlings of the mind but it doesn't stick because not yet who are you and who are you built into the hari krishna mantra is who are you but you know it's something we want to know it we're not the mind that's part of the thing is detachment from what you're not and the the mind is part of what you're not and the, the thoughts and emotions so a uh, one recommendation he'll give some more but just a quick response to your question early in the morning chat your rounds when you come back from work why make it harder for yourself than you have to and qualitatively so and quantitatively i've done that too okay i mean it and just practice it the the abhyasa idea and it, it's 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 true it's true many nice anecdotal stories but it's true you practice and practice and practice and then it just becomes part of your life because it's a practice and then because it's there in the early part of the day it has its impact to the rest of the day as opposed to trying to calm the mind at the end of the work day it means no harm in also doing chanting at the end of your work day 
but if there's ballast, it, it can make it easier, especially over a period of time. Do, did you know that Prabhupada, as a householder, he would chant some of his rounds during different parts of the day? He didn't always chant his rounds in the morning. I mean, it was, it's not like a major part of what's important to know about Prabhupada because he was, he was attached to Krishna completely. But he followed rules, and one of those rules was regular keeping his vrata in chanting. And it was in different times of the day. So it's doable. But you have to have good ballast. It's 830. Yes, I see a hand back there. Hare Krishna Maharaj, um, in one of the slides, <laughs> in one of the slides, um, you had mentioned about you, human beings and animals hear different frequencies of sound. So, how uh, do... One, one, I didn't catch it because there was some noise yeah. going on back there. In one of the slides... It said what? In one of the slides... It said what? Yeah, you had mentioned about human beings can access only a certain frequency of yeah, sound. Yes, yes correct. As an animals and bats will have yeah, a higher yes, yes, frequency. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, how do we access the frequency of Hare Krishna Mahamantra, which is like above the material uh, sound? Ah, clever question. Well, a simple understanding is, supposing somebody had a meter, a, you know, a hertz meter, and they heard chanting, they heard Badahari's chanting. It would, re it would fall within that range because the material instruments are not going to measure spiritual sound. They're going to measure material sound within audible range between this and that. It would measure in one of those frequencies. But there's something else going on besides that. That's just the audible range. And then there's para sound or spiritual sound. And that does something in addition to its audible. as a spiritual element or component and it acts directly on the soul. Okay? Okay, Maharaj. Clever question. Okay, looks like we're done. So that's, what's our schedule tomorrow? Who wants to tell us what our schedule tomorrow is? He's following you with the microphone. Hare Krishna, <clears throat> thank, thank you all for coming for the first session. So tomorrow we again start around 